And uh, we start with Kess Anstein and his presentation. Thank you. Okay, great. So I have no slides. This is going to be uh, uh, just from the mouth, uh, if you'll indulge me. Uh, there was a conference at the University of Chicago a number of years ago where the main speaker was John Rawls. And uh, Rawls's reaction to the conference about uh, two particular uh, members of the University of Chicago faculty was this. He said, they're very good, but they lack curiosity. And he said, they're not puzzled. And he said, that is, that is a fatal, Rawls is a very gentle person, but he said, that's a fatal problem. Uh, so this is, uh, I was very struck by Rawls's uh, uncharacteristic censoriousness, and it was censoriousness directed toward the absence of puzzlement. And so this is uh, about a puzzle. And uh, here is the puzzle, that if you look at fuel economy regulations and energy efficiency regulations uh, all over the world, uh, they have the following characteristic. First, uh, the cost-benefit analysis is frequently excellent. That is, the benefits greatly exceed the costs. Uh, but second, in order for the statement I just made to be true, we have to count the consumer savings from the fuel efficiency and energy efficiency rules, and counting the consumer savings puts us right into the problem of paternalism. That is to say, with respect to automobiles or appliances, consumers can choose energy efficient or fuel efficient products if they want. They're not making those choices. The regulatory requirements are forcing people to make choices that they're not making. So we're right into the paternalistic box and it's not easy to identify a standard market failure that justifies the interventions. So if we need, pursuant to the first panel, an, an ordinary market failure to justify a regulation, it's not easy to identify one in this context. So that's the, that's the puzzle. Uh, and what I'm going to do now is say something about the standard approach, standard economic approach to these problems, and then raise two problems uh, that are behaviorally informed, one that pushes in the direction of nudging and the other that pushes in the direction of hard paternalistic regulation. Okay, so the standard idea would be for fuel efficiency or energy efficiency regulations, the principal uh, motivation for regulation is there's an externality. So if you buy a car that emits uh, air pollutants, you want a response that is perfectly directed toward the economic cost imposed on third parties, and the cost should be a corrective tax. So the standard idea would be we would worry about usual air pollution, we would worry about greenhouse gases, and we might worry about energy independence or national security which could argue for a corrective tax, supposing we could monetize the cost of being dependent on foreign oil. And then we just have a solution, which would be to impose the tax, as Europe, of course, does. And then we would declare victory. That would be the end of the situation. There would be no need for a regulatory requirement beyond the corrective tax. Now, even on standard economic assumptions, it might be thought that the corrective tax doesn't handle the fact that consumers might be interested in saving money from energy-efficient products. And there the idea would be, at most, what we should do is ensure that consumers are properly informed. And there we'd have to identify the market failure, which would require an informational response but maybe there is a, a potential market failure, maybe information's a public good that would call for a disclosure strategy. So then we might say that on standard economic assumptions, the two tools are first, an economic incentive to correct the externality, and second, some sort of informational remedy to make sure that consumers know that they could gain from, uh, from energy efficient products. And that would be it. 
Okay, now I promised to discuss two problems to um, uh, raise with respect to the standard economic approach. And now let me uh, deliver on that promise. Uh, the first is that information needs to be salient and comprehensible. So we might think that information as such is too vague a remedy, and if we are concerned about uh, behavioral matters, we we'll want to ensure that people actually understand what they're hearing. Uh, in the United States government, there were two um, labels for automobiles that were proposed to the American public. Complete transparency, by the way. These were uh, labels that you could find just by clicking, and the public was asked to render its judgment on the two. One of the two actually had letter grades, A, B, C. So you could see this automobile is an A, this automobile is a B, this automobile is a C in terms of energy efficiency. The other proposal didn't have letter grades. It had a monetary number saying the annual fuel cost is this for this car, is that for that car. It's a nice question, isn't it, which is the better response on standard economic or behavioral grounds to the potential difficulty consumers have in figuring out how much they're going to uh, save from an energy efficient car. Uh, we, and I was working for the government at the time, we chose the uh, monetary figure rather than the letter grade. And the theory was the letter grade could actually be confusing. It could suggest that the government was grading automobiles rather than grading fuel efficiency. And the monetary figure was a, uh, was a more uh, fine-tuned nudge to try to ensure that consumers could see what they were getting. Okay, I think that's one kind of case study that suggests a potentially modest response to what's on standard economic assumptions is at least potentially a problem with, with the market. Then the question is, uh, the harder puzzle is this. If you have a fuel economy standard that is aggressive, uh, it is possible that the benefits will completely dwarf the costs. And in fact, those are our numbers, that f cars in the United States are going to get much more fuel efficient, and on benefit cost analysis, the, these are extremely good rules. We're talking about billions of euros in annual net benefits. Okay. The problem with that analysis is that three categories of benefits are not externalities. Uh, uh, principally, I'll just point to two, uh, are money and time. So consumers are going to be saving much more money over the life of a vehicle than they're going to be spending up front. And that is a consumer saving that is very significant. Indeed, it's about 80% of the total benefit of the fuel economy rule comes from consumer benefits. Another significant chunk of the benefits come from the monetized time savings. You don't have to go to the gas station so much. And once you monetize that, that's also very significant. The externality benefits in terms of air pollution, greenhouse gases, and energy security, they don't come close to being sufficient to justify the fuel economy rules. So is the problem clear? Mm -hmm. That on standard economic grounds, these rules are uh, indefensible. And we have, interestingly, both an academic objection to the fuel economy rules, which is that what makes the benefit cost analysis work involves no market failure, and therefore it is an illegitimate factor. And this is something that has not escaped the attention of some non-academic <laughs> politicians who urge that the fuel economy standards are indefensible uh, because they are paternalistic. And the fact that there is a form of collective self-binding, which is true, uh, is not uh, convincing to the academic and non-academic skeptics with the non-academic skeptics saying the American people as a whole have not agreed to self-bind in this way, and the academics say this is a for, uh, kind of Ulysses gone mad, where Ulysses is actually harming mm -hmm. his own interests. And Ulysses, by the way, isn't an agent who's behind these rules. It's instead government officials. 
Okay, now here's uh, what seems to me the deep puzzle. If you look at the fuel economy rules, it's very hard to give an account in accordance with which the benefit-cost analysis is wrong. The benefits are very high. Consumers aren't losing in the sense of getting uglier or less powerful or less safe cars. Along every dimension about which consumers care, the cars that follow the fuel economy rules are more expensive up front, less expensive to operate, and otherwise the same. So we were very worried that there was going to be a consumer welfare loss in the form of weaker cars, less safe cars, less aesthetic cars. And working with the car companies, we could identify no consumer welfare loss. That's the puzzle. So what is the proper analysis in a case in which consumers are on net significantly better off, and yet they're not demanding those cars? Now, the answer to that, I think the short answer is just a question mark. The slightly longer answer would say what uh, Professor Bargill has termed behavioral market failures. And here is a, a supplement to the previous excellent panel, which would say that Professor Bargill and others have identified the possibility of behavioral market failures that can justify, in theory, coercion, or nudges, and here the United States government has taken on board this category, behavioral market failures, by saying there are three things that might be going on. One is present bias or myopia, that is insufficient attention to the long term. Another is a lack of salience, where the fuel economy benefits of a fuel efficient car are not sufficiently salient to enough consumers at the time of purchase. And a third possibility is some form of loss aversion, where at least the upfront economic loss looms very large for consumers. And so the governing theory, what the US government has used, both for the fuel efficiency requirements and for energy efficiency generally, is to say we have a cost-benefit analysis. It suggests on welfare grounds, consumers are gaining much more than they're losing. We have at least a set of accounts of why there's a behavioral market failure that justifies the intervention. And therefore, we're going forward. But on the data that explains why the fuel efficiency and energy efficiency requirements are warranted in face of the standard economic critique, there's still a great deal to learn. And I should say that both in Europe and the United States, that large question mark remains, where giving a standard analytic account of why the benefit-cost analysis is right is not easy. But I think everyone who stared at the benefit-cost analysis has found it uh, convincing in the sense that there doesn't seem to be anything missing from the judgment that this behaviorally informed set of steps uh, is justified on social welfare grounds. And thank you. <laughs> before, before we come to the next panelist, one, one, just one question. Is the full economy rule a statutory rule or is it an executive? How does that, what okay. kind of form is that? Okay, it's authorized by statute, mm -hmm. but its content is specified by the Environmental Protection Agency mm -hmm. and the Department okay. of Transportation. So okay. they had discretion mm -hmm. to do much less. Please. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> I will use slides, but very few, so don't be, um, don't be worried. Um, I work at the European Commission. You had, uh, in the previous panel, another um, uh, member of the European uh, Commission who, came from, who comes from, from the policy-making field. Uh, but the European Commission has also a second function, which is the enforcement of the law. Uh, in particular, the European competition rules or antitrust rules, as they are called in the US. In fact, we are the equivalent of the Department of Justice um, and the Federal Trade Commission 
in the United States. Um, and so we take antitrust decisions directed against companies against which they can appeal to the courts in Luxembourg. And I would like to walk you through uh, two cases, one that we have dealt with and the other one that we are currently dealing with, to show you how um, behavioral economics can play um, a role in our work. But before I do that, I'd like to quickly set the scene by showing you three elderly gentlemen. Uh, two of them already passed away. One of them is still alive. You, f you see on your, on your left-hand side um, the oldest of the three, whom you all know and you probably have uh, read his, his major work, but there's one book that I would really recommend you to read, um, more than the others, in, in my view, which is uh, The Theory of Modern uh, Sentiments, where he speaks about how uh, people should behave. He talks about wise and judicious um, conduct, about splendid virtues, about strong bene benevolence. But then he says that man doesn't really always live up to that. And, and here I quote, uh, and he says that man's passions are apt to mislead him sometimes to drive him, sometimes to seduce him, to violate all the rules which he himself, in all his sober and cool hours, approves of. That sounds very modern, I think. Um, and then we make a big leap to the, um, to the next two gentlemen, which stand for a different school of thought, which is the, uh, the theory of rational choice. Now, under the rational choice theories, which is associated with the University of Chicago, about which we've heard already a lot, um, posits that people always respond rationally and uniformly to incentives, positive incentives or negative incentives, financial incentives, that is, that they act on the basis of universal and stable preferences, and this preference is the maximization of wealth. That is what people want to do, that's what they always do. And they are perfectly uh, informed, uh, as are the producers, and the producers operate in perfectly competitive markets, which are markets where prices are transparent, where demand curves are elastic, and where entry is easy as is exit. Consumers compare, always sensibly, they switch as soon as there's a better option, uh, and producers always try to op optimize profits. The two gentlemen here are uh, titans of this school. The first is Robert Bork, who died in 2012, a judge. And, and the, the gentleman on the right is, a, is, a, is another judge, uh, Richard Posner, who, uh, as far as I could see, is the most cited legal scholar of all times, a uh, prolific writer. Um, and, um, and really, uh, these two gentlemen have shaped this school of antitrust thinking, lots of other schools, but in particular of antitrust, which is still the dominant school of thinking, uh, certainly in the United States. Now, there's, of course, a fourth uh, picture missing. Uh, there wasn't enough uh, space on the slides. Um, a picture of somebody who has championed a new uh, way of looking at these kind of things, also linked, of course, to the University of Chicago. Uh, I decided not to put his picture on the slides since he's sitting anyway on this panel. The, the thinking coming from this school of thought uh, obviously, you know uh, already. I, I just want to repeat a few things because they are that they're helpful for the for the rest of the presentations. So we know that people's reactions sometimes deviate from the outcome predicted by the Chicago School, by the rational choice um, uh, theory. Uh, people have initial endowments. They have uh, a taste for fairness. They cannot appreciate future costs. They have lack of self-control, and they operate with heuristics. Some of them are flawed. And in the two examples that I will mention, uh, two of these flaws uh, will play a prominent role. The first is the status quo bias, so inertia, and, uh, and uh, the reliance of default options. And the other one is framing. So let me turn to the first uh, example, which takes me 10 years back, when the Commission, in its role as antitrust enforcer, um, had a problem with uh, Microsoft. Microsoft, at the time, sold its operating system, Windows, that was dominant, um, together with a media player. You all know what a media player is. Um, 
Tying is a concept uh, whereby I sell you one product, but I tell you you have to buy another one. So I, I, I sell you a, a printer, but I tell you you also have to buy my ink cartridges. Now, if I am the dominant printer producer, and you, so everybody has my printers, you all have my printers, and I tell you you have to buy my ink cartridges, that means that nobody else, for example, Johanna, is not going to be able to sell you her ink cartridges because you all have mine. Uh, so I extend my monopoly from, from, from the printer market into a completely different market, which is the one for ink cartridges. And that is what we thought Microsoft was doing by, by pre-installing the Windows media player into Windows, which means that none of the other media players, and there were some around, actually better ones, um, they, didn't, they didn't manage to get a foothold there. Now, what were these two gentlemen, I mean, the two, the, the, the man in the center and the man on, on the right, what, what would they say? They say, well, there obviously isn't a problem. There obviously isn't a problem. Because a, a consumer who unpacks yeah, his Windows uh, box and uploads it, or it's actually already on the laptop that you buy, you start it up, the, um, the, um, the, the Microsoft Windows player pops up. Well, if you don't like it, you go to the internet, you download it, a different one. You compare, you check, you choose. Um, Microsoft doesn't force you to install the um, or to, to, to stick with the uh, with the Windows, with the um, media player. Um, you can download for free another one. Uh, and clearly, if you find others better, you will download the other one. And clearly, if you don't do that, well, that's it's not an antitrust problem. That is just competition on the merits. Because if you don't, if you do not switch, that can only have one reason, and this one reason is that the Windows media player is superior to the other media players. Because otherwise, you would have switched. Now, the problem with that rational choice Chicago School approach was that it was pretty undisputed in the case uh, that the Windows media player was actually not better than the other media players. And yet, the others didn't manage to get into, into the market. And so the problem was with the default pre-installation of the media player. Now, for the, uh, for the Chicago School, for the rational choice, for the Robert Borg and Richard Posner, uh, that is completely irrelevant. Default options are ir irrelevant. Because if you can choose at no cost, and at great ease, you will do so, because you are perfectly rational. So here was the problem. So what, uh, what did we do? Um, we couldn't have listened, of course, at the time at, at Professor Sansin's speech of yesterday, where at number one, I think he put default options as, um, as the most important um, nudge. Um, we, of course, know that people stick with the default option, even if they could switch very, very easily. And in antitrust, uh, we see that the default option actually can foreclose competitors who do not manage to get into, uh, into the market. Because what drives competition is an active and deliberate choice of consumers. And as soon as consumers do not take active and deliberate choices, but just stick with the default option, what happens is that the competition is to be the default option. That's where you need to be, the default option or the first option. Otherwise, you simply uh, don't get in. So we took a decision uh, against Microsoft, uh, explicitly, and I, I quote from the decision, relying on the end users in inertia being the main problem, inertia. So it's not a rational choice Chicago school argument, it's inertia, it's, inertia, it's, it's uh, behavioral economics actually before the term was, um, was uh, coined. And um, Microsoft uh, protested, went to the court and said, what is this? The commission is employing, and I quote again, a novel and highly speculative theory, relying on prospective analysis of possible reactions of users. So completely hocus-pocus, they said. And the court in Luxembourg, uh, however, uh, agreed that the commission was right to take into account the fact that consumers will stick with the pre-installed uh, media player and are generally less likely to switch to another one. So that's the example. Now, um, that was in 2004, so the remedy that we came up with at the time, other than a fine of half a billion euros, which is not a remedy, it's a fine, but how did, we solve, how did we think we could solve that problem for the future? We told Microsoft to untie the browser from the media player and to sell 
these products differently. So they could sell the, the combined package, but they also had to sell a Windows operating system without the media player. Well, that was in 2004. Um, nobody actually uh, bought that uh, naked um, operating system. Uh, had na the book Nudge already been published at the time, probably would have done it differently, but it wasn't. Nudge came out only in 2008, I think. Um, and so I turned to another variant of the same case. A few years later, the um, uh, Commission had another issue with Microsoft of the same sort, but this time Microsoft was bundling the Explorer, the Internet Explorer, with the operating system. So again, uh, we, um, we looked at that. Uh, we found that downloading a competing uh, browser, which of course existed, uh, was easy, it was cheap, but users didn't do it. Again, the same inertia, the same search costs led to the default option uh, prevailing every time. Uh, because consumers would have, taken, have to take an active decision not to use the pre-installed default browser, which was the Internet Explorer. So we did a survey, consumer survey, to find out how do consumers react. Uh, and that survey showed a very significant information deficit on the part of consumers. I mean, some, uh, a lot of people actually thought that the Internet Explorer actually is the Internet. <laughs> so that's, that is just the same thing. Internet Explorer is the Internet. So, I mean, then to expect that those people would, would you know, look for other browsers on the web and start downloading, I mean, that, that wasn't really realistic. So this time, 2009, um, we came up with a different remedy. So Microsoft um, committed to do a number of things. Including, uh, including the following. When you are a Microsoft uh, Windows user, and if you have already had pre-installed the, um, the, uh, the uh, Internet um, Explorer browser, you get an, a Windows update. And when you run the update, you get this uh, slide here, which tells you a number of things. First, it tells you what the browser is, uh, it tells you that there are other browsers in, in the world out there. Um, it tells you that what you will get next is a choice screen. I'll come to this in a second. And it reminds you that you have to be connected to the internet in order to um, uh, download another browser. Now, of course, you're smiling and laughing, but believe me, uh, this is very valuable advice for many, many consumers. You will be surprised. Those who think that the Internet Explorer is the same as the internet would appreciate that sort of um, information. And once you click on OK in the left, uh, left hand corner, you get to the choice screen. So what you have here is um, a screen which shows in random order. Random order, by the way, was very important. In the first iteration of this process, Microsoft had proposed a different order, I think. <laughs> and, um, and of course, as we know from behavioral economics um, uh, applied to, um, to search, uh, people tend to look on the left side of the screen, and then they go to the center, and then they stop looking. You can measure this by eyeball tracking. So um, that is why we have insisted on, on a randomization. So you get these five most popular browsers randomly ordered, and you can Download them very, very easily just by clicking on the install button. If you feel harassed by this slide, you just click on the uh, select later button and then it disappears. And I think after two or three times, uh, it disappears entirely. Um, the Microsoft Internet browser is the default browser still. So if you, don't, if you actively decide not to be bothered to download any of these others, then you stick with the um, Microsoft browser. But as soon as this window opens, the Internet Explorer pin, which is on the on top, gets unpinned, disappears. So you have to put it back. Um, so this remedy was more effective uh, than, than the previous one. And since that remedy uh, became effective, there were about 165 million downloads from that, from that very page that you see, which is, I think, no longer active because the, um, the remedy has expired. And you also saw a drop in market share of the Internet Explorer browser, which was, uh, which was bigger than it was in the US. In the US, the market share also fell, uh, but much less than, 
than in Europe. So I think um, I think this was an effective remedy, certainly more effective than just telling Microsoft to you know ship a version of Windows uh, without uh, a Microsoft without um, a browser. <coughs> And now, interestingly, the, the browser that, uh, uh, that surpassed Internet Explorer was Google's Chrome, uh, which, which brings me to the second case I'd like to talk about, um, which is Internet Search. The first question that we need to, um, that we need to consider is whether um, consumers behave in the same way when they go to a shop buying, let's say, apples, and if you don't like the apples because they are either too big or too small or too soft or too hard or too, too expensive, you go to the shop next door and you buy your apples there. Um, so does it happen in the same way uh, when you search for information? Now, that is certainly what um, these two gentlemen, not Adam Smith, Borg and Posner, uh, would tell you. They would say it's exactly the same thing. If you're not happy uh, with um, what you're looking for, for example, uh, information on a search engine, if you're not happy with that, with the quality of that information, you, you choose a different search engine. There are many other <laughs> search engines. Uh, the next search engine is just a click away, as Robert Borg <coughs> has actually put it. Just a click away. So um, that's just not a problem. Of course. Um, consumer uh, surveys show something else, uh, and that it shows, and that maybe that is maybe you can confirm that when you search, um, most people click on the first link. Now, significantly less people, fewer people click on the second link. Now, there may be people that go all the way down to the fifth link, but that is very rare, uh, and almost nobody goes any further, and certainly nobody goes to the second page. Um, which is below the fold. It's like in a newspaper when the journalist always try to be above the fold when you hold the newspapers, and if, if you have to turn it around, that's already less, less good. The same seems to be the case when you, when you search on the web. So it really matters where in the list of search results you are. Um, we started an investigation um, looking into Google's practices, including uh, search, because there were um, suspicions that they that Google may alter the uh, the natural outcome of these uh, of these uh, searches. This procedure is ongoing, so I cannot really say anything about it. But I can give you a few uh, illustrations of um, of what we're talking about. So you all have used Google, I think, a lot. So I just give you a, f uh, a few comments uh, about the things that we were looking into. Um, and, and one of the concerns was about specialized uh, search services. So when you look for a particular product, when you look for a hotel or a restaurant or flight, um, which is called vertical search, as opposed to you search for the Verfassungsblock conference in, 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 in Berlin. Um, and what we found, what, what you will find when you use Google, is that Google's own specialized search results come on top. Others come later. And our concern was that this favorable treatment of Google's own vertical search services is a disadvantage for competing vertical search services. Um, and although these other results could be just as relevant, maybe even more relevant than Google's own results. Uh, but since they're less visible, uh, traffic would be diverted to Google's own vertical search services. So the importance of the visual format, which is a kind of framing, uh, is very important uh, to attract a certain number of, a sufficient number of clicks. Uh, so it was important to make sure that the presentation of, this, of the rival links is comparable to the ones of Google. So what Google has proposed, or what we have suggested that uh, that could be a solution, is that Google guarantees that whenever they promote their own specialized search service on a page, the service of a rival would be, displaced, uh, would, would be displayed in a comparable manner. So, um, in practice, if Google puts, f uh, as a result, result of a search, its own specialized uh, search results, then three rival results must also be displayed in a way which is as prominent and as visible as its own 
results. So let's see how that looks like. So when you search for, let's say, a, a gas grill, you get this. So that's the, um, the standard outcome of, um, of a search. It's from last year, so maybe, maybe the gas grills have, uh, have changed. So what do you see? You see on top of the page, you see only Google specialized search service with a picture, right? Now, these pictures are very important. Consumers click where the picture is. They don't click where there's no picture. So that is important. Uh, and in order to sort of balance this out or to nudge consumers that are thereby nudged back into the other direction, Google proposed to do this, which offers, as you can see, links to three, three rival vertical search engines, uh, also with pictures of the same size and the same quality uh, as Google's own picture. And in addition, these three competitors are themselves in full control of that picture. So they can, uh, they can decide what this picture shows, they can decide to where this link leads, etc. The same is true, by the way, for tablets. So if you do it on an iPad or, um, or any other tablet, you would get a similar uh, design. It's just a bit differently, uh, differently ordered so that it works for, for the app. And the same is true when you do uh, a local search. So imagine you're looking for a cafe in Paris. If you do that today, this happens. So you see the map of Paris, and then you see, uh, you see all these cafes. Now, all of these links will lead you to Google Specialized uh, local search. Okay? Uh, it's true that there may be other um, vertical search engines that also give you uh, perhaps even more accurate or, or, or better, more useful information of cafes in Paris, but you don't see them because they're not on the page. Maybe, maybe they're on page two or three or four, I don't know, but they're not, they're not on this page and you will not look any further than this page. Um, and so again, the idea is to put on the, at the very top, you can see that. Um, I mean, there are no pictures because Google itself doesn't use pictures, so there are no pictures for the competitors either. But you see the three rival vertical search engines, huh? which is um, Via Michelin, Yelp, and Page Jaune, so the, 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 the principal French uh, local um, search engines that offer this kind of service, you find them on the top. So there, the, the user really has a choice. He, he sees them very clearly. He sees them as clearly as Google's own results and, and therefore could make, uh, could make a choice. As I said, this, uh, this case is on, ongoing. <laughs> so um, I don't know where, where, where this case will lead to, which remedies ultimately uh, will be adopted. These are proposals that have been made last year. They're public, so that's why I can, I can share them with you. Um, I can't say uh, much else, but I think what I want to um, convey to you is that, at least in the area of antitrust enforcement, behavioral economics can play a role in particular when you analyze how consumers behave or react to uh, the practices of a dominant uh, company. Uh, and then in the second phase, when you create, uh, when you design a, a remedy that we, uh, that we take into account how consumers will, will react so that we can tackle Actually, the problem with the first Microsoft remedy was a failure because we didn't do that. Uh, the second one, I think, worked much better because we did. And, and in Google, we have to see what, um, what comes out of it. Thank you. Again, just one informative question. Um, who would choose the competitors that are shown? There's a very complicated uh, auction-based okay. mechanism. Okay. Uh, which is fairly complex. I can explain that to you yeah. afterwards. But, uh, yeah. you, but you need a PhD in economics, yeah. to, uh, which I don't have. But I, I can, I I can give you a simple. I, I can, I can give you a simpler uh, version. But there is. Okay. That was obviously a very important question, mm -hmm. um, uh, and it took a long time to figure out uh, how um, how how to do this. Uh, there's a lot of auctioning and selling going on on uh, on, on, on Google, uh, and so they came up with a system. Okay. To, to, to make sure. Please. Right. So, um, first I want to thank you uh, for inviting me to this conference and uh, for giving me the opportunity to discuss my case with you. 
Um, it is a quite or rather German case, but I hope I can make it interesting for everyone. Um, so when the state pursues objectives such as the rise of the birth rate or the promotion of gender equality, it is obvious that it is more promising for the from the legislator's point of view to go for options, not obligations, and for choice, not command. Accordingly, we can find a number of laws in public family law that do not force people to a certain behavior, but take a softer approach. In my statement now, I would like to discuss the normative requirements or directives for such measures on the basis of one specific regulation that is meant to um, promote gender equality. Uh, this is the so-called partner months. In what follows, I will shortly explain the prevailing legislation. Then I will outline how the courts assessed its compatibility with the fi fundamental rights. And lastly, I will share with you my personal view and try to develop some general ideas on the legitimacy of non-imperative tools of behavioral guidance under constitutional law. First, the statutory situation. Since 2007, parents in Germany are entitled to Elterngeld. Elterngeld can be described as a monthly childcare benefit that allows parents to stay at home after the birth of a child. The benefit amount depends on the previous earnings of the beneficiaries, as a general rule, the allowance amounts to 67% of the previous income. The claim period is 14 months. However, one parent's eligibility is restricted to 12 months only, and the period is extended only if the second parent likewise stays at home for at least two months. The German legislator explicitly conceived the partnerments as a measure of behavioral guidance. The stated objective of the legislation was to provide an incentive for parents not to assign family work to the one part and employment to the other. It is the stated aim of the measure to break down traditional role assignments with their discriminating effects in the labor market. As you can see, the partnerments do not force anybody to a certain behavior. It is still perfectly legitimate if one parent stays at home. However, if father and mother both interrupt their career, uh, they receive, depending on their previous income, between 600 or, and, six, and 3,600 euros from the state. You can call this a bonus, but please note that parents opting for the partnerments, financially speaking, still make a loss, as only 67% of the income is being compensated. I'm not sure if Kess Sunstein and Richard Thaler would uh, describe this regulation as a nudge. Maybe you, uh, dear Professor Sunstein, would rather call it an incentive. I would love to hear your opinion uh, on this later. Either way, the par partnerments are not imperative and they, are not seen, uh, and they can be seen as a variant form of libertarian paternalism. Now I would like to move to the question of the partnerments' compatibility with the German constitution. For the guests from other jurisdictions, I would like to shortly explain how Germans generally examine the compatibility of state measures with fundamental rights. Very short, very briefly. A potential violation of a right of freedom is determined in three steps. As a first step, we ask if there is a fundamental right whose area of protection is affected. As a second step, we ask whether the measure in question interferes with this fundamental right. Um, that's what Michael Heinig uh, described as uh, uh, Eingriff in ein Schutzbereich. And in a third step, we um, ask whether the interference might be justified. When it comes to nudges and incentives, the most specific question to my uh, impression relates to the second step. Do incentives and nudges put a limit to the addressee's freedom? This question has been subject to several disputes before the courts. Performing the first step, most courts agreed that the partnermans would fall into the scope of Article 6 of the Basic Law, in its classical meaning as a right of defense against intrusions by the state, Article 6 protects the citizens' freedom to independently choose how to lead their family lives. This freedom, according to the Federal Constitutional Court, includes the freedom to decide whether a child should be under the care of mainly one parent, both parents in mutual supplementation, or under the additional care of a third person, as well as the freedom to decide on the parent's respective contribution to the family income. When the, court when the courts determined as a second step whether the partnerments interfere with the fundamental rights of marriage and family, they came to very different conclusions. I will read to you the essential passages of the court's rulings. 
a regional social court, the Landessozialgericht Niedersachsen Bremen, held that the partner months interfere with fundamental rights. It stated that the freedom of making choices with regard to family life would not be restricted only if a decision was made formally impossible or if it was prevented with nearly irresistible pressure, but freedom was limited already when the state links disadvantages to a certain kind of decision. Another regional social court, the Landessozialgericht Nordrhein-Westfalen, in contrast, did not find the partnermans encroach upon a fundamental right. The judgment says, whether one or both parents interrupt their career and choose the partnermans is left to their own decision. They are not forced by a command or prohibition to lead their family life in a certain way. The partnermans provide an offer that can be accepted or refused. This offer does not irresistibly urge parents to a certain kind of behavior because it does not force them, neither legally nor factually, to a certain decision. The Federal Social Court, das Bundessozialgericht, agreed. It reasoned the partnermans may have influence on how parents assume their parental responsibility. Never, nevertheless, the partnermans' freedom of choice is not affected in a constitutionally relevant way. The law would not, would not exercise forbidden coercion, but would merely create incentives. <coughs> the Federal Constitutional Court, das Bundesverfassungsgericht, too, has delivered two judgments on the partnermans. And you might be curious, but I'm sorry I have to disappoint you. The Federal Constitutional Court left open, of all things, the question whether the partnermans interfere with fundamental rights. It just skipped the second step, jumped to the third, and held that the legislation was in any case justified. I will come back to the question of justification later. Um, after the judgment of the Federal Constitutional Court, there's no doubt that the partnermans are ultimately compatible with the Constitution. However, the judgment does not add any flesh to the bones when it comes to the general question of the legitimacy of non-imperative legislation under constitutional law. The question whether, interf whether it interferes with the addressee's freedom uh, remained unresolved. I would now like to share my thoughts uh, on this with you. In my opinion, the partnermans interfere with the fundamental rights of the parents addressed. Article 6 protects a free space in which individuals are meant to make decisions as they please. Therefore, it is not sufficient if the state leaves options open for the parents. The state must also restrain from linking options with different consequences. I suggest that in cases like this, one should perform a comparison between different alternatives of behavior and their attached legal consequences. It is, so to speak, a behavioral approach that um, includes considerations regarding the principle of equality. I consider this approach appropriate and necessary when dealing with legislation that is like the partnermans meant to, meant to steer people's behavior. Some scholars consider it crucial to what extent different options are differently treated. They find that the partnermans do not exceed the threshold to be considered an interference with Article 6, as only 67% of the income is compensated. Not to take advantage of the partnermans would, financially speaking, still be the more attractive alternative. Within the framework of this logic, we would only have an interference with fundamental rights if, say, the benefit would amount to 110% of the previous income. This does not convince me when, it comes to, uh, when we are talking about legislation with the sole aim of changing behavior. Um, unequal treatment is unequal treatment. The extent of inequality is, to my mind, only relevant to determine the severity of the, unequal, uh, of the intervention. It can therefore be taken account of at the step three at uh, for the justification. This brings me to the third step. Regarding the justification of the partnerments as such, I could be brief and I could just say that I go with the Federal Constitutional Court. It held that the partnerments do not violate fundamental rights because they are suitable to serve the constitutional obligation to promote the actual implementation of equal rights for women and men. However, as Professor Sunstein is here and as we are discussing the concept of libertarian paternalism in general, I would like to draw your attention to one aspect that to me seems very important when it comes to the question of the justification of nudging. In their book, Cass Sunstein and Richard Thaler do not explicitly justify Nudge's th step three style. However, to my impression, when uh, Sunstein and Thaler write on the legitimacy of nudging, they do discuss an aspect that German constitutional lawyers would uh, discuss at step three, namely the aims of nudges. 
Sunstein and uh, Thaler claim that the paternalistic aspect of their concept is legitimate because it is aimed at making, making people's lives longer, healthier and better. Nudges would influence decisions in a way, as Sunstein and Thaler put it, that will make choosers better off as judged by themselves. To be blunt, I do not consider this purportedly individualistic approach applicable under German constitutional law. The basic law's concept of fundamental rights of freedom is very difficult to reconcile with the concept of citizens who need to be told by the state what is better for them. One might argue that in German constitutional law the paternalistic aspect is only very well disguised. Don't we justify measures on ground on consumer protection, for example? And where's the difference between consumer protection and the personal interests of individual consumers? I find that there is a different difference. The idea of consumer protection, as well as, for example, the idea of public health, openly generalizes and does not pretend to, pre to represent every single citizen. But this comes with the cost that consumer protection cannot be invoked to justify interferences with fundamental rights of the consumers themselves. It is normally invoked to justify interferences with fundamental rights of, let's say, the food companies or, the, or other branches of um, economy. The measures might be justified because a democratic majority wants consumers in general to be protected in a certain way, for example, by information disclosure. But these measures cannot be justified because it is better for every single consumer to, for example, eat less calories. Accordingly, the Federal Constitutional Court held that the partnerments were justified because they were suitable to break down traditional role assignments in the labor market. It rightly did not base its argument on the idea that the partnerments would serve the parents' individual interests in having equal or even better partnerships. <clears throat> to be clear on this, I think nudges can be justified. They often will be. But under German constitutional law, we cannot justify them on grounds of the addressee's interests. I do not even see how the government or the legislator can know the addressee's interest. They can rather know or better democratically determine what's in the public interest. And that has to be invoked for justification. Thank you. Perhaps again, one question to the, to the merits or to the facts, which is, um, what about the effects of the statute? Um, so, um, is there a follow-up and that the statute somehow changed roles and that more, yes. how many men, how many women t took it? Uh, I don't know the, the yeah. exact numbers, but uh, the, uh, even the F Federal Constitutional Court in its judgment um, said that it was uh, suitable f to uh, promote gender equality or to, to break down traditional role assignments in the labor market. And they uh, uh, refer to statistics that uh, suggest that uh, significantly more men now uh, take, uh, take, take uh, uh, child yeah. leave, maternity, maternity leaves. No. Uh, paternity <laughs> leave. Yeah, paternity <laughs> leaves uh, after this uh, statute get, got into force. Mm -hmm. So we have three cases, and I think what is interesting about the three cases is that they are somehow offer solutions and wonder if there's a problem. I mean, that is a little bit the Sunstinian puzzle um, that we um, had a solution for something that um, might be where we might go, what is, we have intu intu intuition about the problem, but maybe we have a defined problem. And maybe we can even say that about the commission. The commission was very sure where is the problem, but if this lives up to the standard of a problem in terms of, you know, econ economic state of the art, might be open. And, and Johanna, again, was looking for, Johanna was looking for the question of if there is even an interference with rights beyond the question of justification, that might again wonder it is quite cumbersome or it is at least quite demanding to, to reconstruct the still, um, um, here um, a legal problem. That is one thing we should keep in mind. And the second perhaps is there is sometimes, there are sometimes structural analogy, analogies between an economic and, uh, and a legal reconstruction of the questions in, uh, we are discussing. So um, when Johanna Wolf talked about the justification, that reminded me very much of um, Gebhard Kirchkessner's critique of welfareism. It was, there was a similar point made, though it was framed in, 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 different, in a different, um, um, in different concept. Maybe we should, because we have a panel here, we should use one round to talk, have the panelists talking to each other um, shortly. So I might just invite every, any one of you um, to maybe have a question or remark to another panelist. And um, whoever wants to start with that, 
It's, it's voluntary, I'm just nudging you. Um, 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 whoever wants to, would like to say something to the other contribution is very much invited to do that. Okay. Um, Please. Go ahead. Please. I have a question to each of you. So my first question I already asked you. So I would like to, if you, if you think this is an edge or if it's more of an incentive, because it's disputed uh, also in the German literature on this. So, um, yeah, this percentage, whether it's, it's really an incentive or not, because it's still it's not really rational to take the partner months, because it's not really a financial advantage. That's my, my question to you. It's, it sounds as if, if, if I understood it right, that this was, is not a nudge, it's an economic advantage designed to break down standard, econo uh, standard gender roles. So if you offer people a subsidy, that's not a nudge, it's an economic incentive. Though I think your analysis would work even if it were a nudge, if it were you know, some sort of educational thing or trying to invoke social norms or uh, yeah. you could imagine a default yeah. of some kind. So the analysis would go through. So that is my question mm -hmm. for you. So the, the broad question is really how you distinguish between the addressee's interests which you think under German constitutional understandings, that's not a legitimate reason for either, an for either an incentive or a nudge, and the public interest, which you say is. So, so let, can I elaborate a little bit on, put some pressure on that distinction? Uh, so if, suppose you had a rule that said, um, okay, men, we're gonna inform you that if you don't do X and Y and Z, you are, uh, entrenching gender roles. Or suppose you had a rule that said, okay, consumers, uh, if you buy these products, uh, there will be some environmental consequences which will have adverse effects on you, or instead, if you buy these products, it was gonna hurt you over the long term economically. In those latter two categories, the addressee's interests are what the government is concerned about. It's surely not the case that approaches like of that kind would violate the German constitution. If there's a consumer protection measure, which is fully choice preserving, but is addressed completely at steering the consumer in a direction that the government thinks is better for the consumer along one or another dimension, surely that wouldn't be, I'm saying surely with uh, hopefulness rather than uh, information. Surely the German constitutional court wouldn't say Hayek, 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 or Bork, 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 and that's unconstitutional. So, so my suggestion is it can't be that the addressee's interests are an illeg illegitimate ground. Now is that because a fundamental interest isn't at stake? And then just to say a little bit more, the, the public interest, I wonder if that doesn't have to be translated yeah. into the addressee's interest in the end. Yeah. So in the, in, it, we might have cases of standard market failures so that you're not concerned about the addressee, you're concerned about externalities. And maybe that's what's meant by public interest. But in your case, we don't have externalities, we just have norms that the government is trying to uh, break down. And there, it's, it, it really is the addressee's interest, isn't it? It's that the men and women are acting in ways that are inconsistent with the sex equality principle. And so they are the addressees. Now it's not the as judged by themselves standard doesn't easily translate, so I, I agree with that. And the as, as judged by themselves standard wouldn't be the standard in a case where you're trying to promote an equality norm, which maybe is inconsistent with the short term, at least as judged by themselves. But it's clearly the addressee, the men and women who are living in accordance with the norms that are being broken down. So public interest there is very, I hope, individualistic, meaning it's the people, the individuals, whose lives you're trying to make better by ensuring that they don't act in accordance with outmoded norms. Um, okay, thank you. So first, of course, uh, justification is always only needed if there's an interference with fundamental rights. So, so if you think of cases where there's no interference with fundamental rights, which might be often the case when you leave options open, 
uh, then you don't need a, a justification. So you don't have this problem of whether you need individual or whosoever interests. Um, um, for example, I think if you have uh, some disclosure, um, <coughs> mandatory disclosure uh, uh, duties on may maybe the food industry to, to print the calories on the package, I think that doesn't um, hurt the, or doesn't interfere with the fundamental rights of the consumers, but it does interfere on the rights of the uh, food companies. So, so for the fundamental rights of consumers, I don't think you need a justification to, because they, they are not affected, in my view. Um, second, I think, of course, it's not easy to, dis to distinguish between the individual interests and the... Uh, and the, the general public interest, but I, I still think that there's an in, that there's an, a difference, and I think it's more um, more honest. Maybe only maybe it's only more honest to say that, not to pretend that you really make every single individual's life better if they uh, follow this nudge, but that you just have this general idea of making the majority's life better or making the life... Better is also a, a term which I find a, a little bit different. Maybe it's just um, what the majority legit, legitimately yeah. decided to, to, to want for the majority. And of course... Uh, but of course it's not, uh, not every single individual's life that is getting better by, by following this nudge. Sorry. Oops, one, one word about, about these two cases. Um, the full economy rule um, created a puzzle. Is that, do we have this puzzle in, 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 the, in the cases um, um, as described by, um, by Alexander Winterstein, or don't we? Um, do we have a clear market failure here? Um, you think so? I, I expected you to think that. Um, a word on that from you? Sounds right. That there's. <laughs> uh, 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 on the, uh, for Posner and Bork, maybe not. Yeah. But as you describe it, there's inertia is leading people to just go with the browser rather than to having competition. I, I mean, you can you can go uh, a few steps backwards. You can say uh, competition drives prices down and increases innovation. So competition is good for us, right? Now, in order to have competition, you need producers that compete, and you need consumers who make informed and active choices. If consumers don't take informed and active choices, this, comp this positive feedback loop between the producers and the consumers doesn't work, it's broken. And what you see in these two cases is that uh, consumers uh, do not make active choices because they stick with the default. Uh, and so the choice screen forces them to make a decision. It doesn't say which decision, which is the big difference to your case, because you could have had the choice screen, kind of, <laughs> saying, um, look, most uh, couples, in most couples, um, men take the, uh, the uh, no, sorry, women, of course, yeah. women take the maternity leave. Um, uh, so most, most people actually entrench these role models and then you give some other choices and then say, so now you choose. But that's not what they did. They basically tax those who don't. Or rather, they give an incentive to those who, who do. That's for me clearly not... A nudge. That's that's actually pretty intrusive. I, I find also the public good is not clear to me uh, at all. It's a policy choice, you know, uh, which the state makes. Uh, it's a bit the same here because uh, you, um, well, the administration, has decided that it's it's uh, it's better for them to make an upfront invest for consumers to make an upfront investment because over the long run uh, they will save money, which is good for them. You, you, so you are telling them what's good for them. Of course, they can choose. They can say, oh, no, 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 I prefer to spend more money. But So I think that's a bit, that's also, we discussed briefly yesterday um, evening, the, the calories example. Um, uh, because for, for years, if not decades, we have all been told that, that eating butter and similar fats is not a good idea. You should rather eat, use olive oil, etc. Uh, because the saturated fats are actually bad for you. Um, and it, it was only a couple of months ago that a study came out uh, saying that this is complete nonsense, complete bogus. It's just 
wrong, unsupported by evidence. Now, maybe that is also an exaggeration. I don't know. But it could well be that uh, people have been nudged for 20 years in the wrong direction. Um, so I think the key question is, uh, where's the limit for what the authorities uh, should tell people to do, either force them to do or bribe them to do, in your case, um, or, or nudge them? For, for me, that's really the question. And the technique you use, um, that's a question, a question of, um, of degree. But I think our examples are simple in the sense mm -hmm. that you have a market failure and that you address it. And the only way to address it, really, is to make consumers make active choices. That's the only way to do it. Because you, could, you saw the first Microsoft example, just offering consumers the possibility uh, uh, or equipment manufacturers the possibility to use uh, an operat operating system with Windows Media Player and the other one without doesn't, doesn't, doesn't work. So let's open up. Oren was the first, I think. No. So, Mr. Winterstein, I... Stand up. <laughs> Stand up. <laughs> Can I, uh, <laughs> I just regret my... Uh, okay. uh, so, the first question goes to... Um, I'm thinking about the examples that you gave, and I, th I think you're right. There's a clear market failure. In some sense, it seems like a kind of a standard market failure. We're talking about a monopolist who's taking advantage of monopoly power. Another way to think about this, and this is how you framed it, I think, very helpfully, is you're saying that the monopolist is using these behavioral strategies, putting something of mine, a bundled product, as the default. Um, but I want to ask you about another set of cases. I'm wondering, it's not only monopolists who take advantage of these behavioral strategies. We see this happening in markets where, you know, sellers compete. There's no dominant player, say. You can think, you can think of various markets in consumer credit and telecommunications where there are many providers, sellers in the market, and they all use these behavioral strategies. They um, focus our attention on certain dimensions of the product or the price, but not on others. They hide things. They delay certain uh, dimensions of price into the future because, you know, we care more about now than about later. And I'm just wondering what the kind of competition authorities think about the type of mm -hmm. these uses of behavioral strategies by, not by the monopolist, not by Google and Microsoft. Those are the easy cases. What about these harder cases? And again, it seems like you can describe them or the failure in similar terms than those that you used. Instead of competition over being the default, now we have uh, competition over um, the certain dimensions, one or two dimensions that the sellers have chosen to make salient, but not about all the others. When you're talking about consumer choice being the driver of competition, consumer choice is focused only on a certain dimensions but not about all the other dimensions. I'm wondering what competition authority has to say about that. And just another kind of quick question to, to cast on the fuel economy was just, um, again, this goes to the puzzle, what the mm -hmm. problem is. If there's a problem, it seems to me really amazing that there are these huge consumer benefits to be gained from better fuel economy, and yet the market does not provide it. And yeah. so you said that there are, you know, we have these behavioral market failures, but why wouldn't it? This is another way of maybe posing the question in maybe more traditional terms. Why wouldn't we see, I don't know, um, GM or Volkswagen or Toyota coming up and say, look, if you buy our car, mm -hmm. it's going to be over the long run, mm -hmm. you're going to save thousands of euros. Mm -hmm. Why don't we have these automakers coming in and trying to just you know, advertise or educate the public in that direction? Now, it seems one possibility would be here that we have a traditional market failure in terms of kind of collective action. If, you know, these you know, advertisement campaigns to convince the public to look long term might be expensive, and nobody, no one provider wants to do that. But that suggests that maybe one of these solutions, going back to our discussion before about education, maybe one solution would be maybe a, you know, a government sponsored educational campaign about the importance of you know, long term uh, savings in fuel efficiency. Or to take your kind of the specific intervention that you eventually adopted in terms of these kind of annual cost of gasoline on the sticker, that probably is not enough because you need to amortize over the long term. Why don't you provide, in addition to the sticker price of the car, total cost of ownership over the kind of the entire you know life of a car? The total price is going to be X, taking into account both the upfront and the kind of amortized 
cost of gasoline. Wouldn't that be a solution, maybe even a softer nudge, that would solve the problem? Yes. Um, just on, on the fuel efficiency, um, when I lived in the United States and I, I did buy a car, I did look at that sticker, uh, and I did, it, I did find it helpful, of course, being a lawyer, and you read that sticker, is that, that size, actually. Uh, it's, it's actually a sheet of paper with a lot of fine print. So, of course, when you go through the fine print and all the waivers and this does not apply depending on what subject to, et cetera, it becomes a bit less clear. But I, I, I did find, <laughs> I, I did find the, the, the numerical figure very, very helpful. Uh, on your question, the, um, um, a number of competition authorities in, in, in the European member states Uh, who apply the national competition rules as we apply the European competition rules, have in fact um, set, uh, set up a joint uh, bodies with the, um, uh, co um, the uh, consumer protection authority. So you have uh, joint authorities looking at competition policy and consumer protection because they are obviously linked for the very purposes that you um, have mentioned. If you go to a website uh, buying a flight, you know... Uh, 19 euros to go to, uh, to Rome, who wouldn't want to do that? And you start clicking. Oh, but then when you get to the pay button, or just before the pay button, actually there come all the other the fees for the fuel and for this and for this and for that, and then you have a 120 euro ticket. Now, I think there's legislation now that bans this kind of practice, but that's consumer protection legislation. Antitrust law is only concerned about the behavior of dominant companies. If non-dominant companies are not in a cartel, because if they do, then that's another concern. But if they behave um, individually, so to speak, um, and they abuse of, um, or the, the, they make use of all the biases and, and heuristics that consumers, um, like we all, um, have, that is not an antitrust concern. Uh, but it is a consumer protection concern. Uh, the analysis is similar, um, and, um, but the... The setup is a different one, and the sanctions are a different one. Uh, the consumer protection, of course, they, they're looking at regulation and, um, and legislation, whereas we uh, uh, sanction behavior of, in, of individual companies. So um, if somebody's not dominant, then neither we nor the United States authorities, by the way, can do anything uh, about their, their behavior. That is, that, that is competition. Uh, it may not be fair competition in behavioral terms, consumer protection terms, but it is fair competition in the sense of, of antitrust. Okay, so th th this is a very major question, both theoretically and practically, that uh, Warren's raising. So why don't we see um, automobile companies and appliance providers having very aggressive advertising campaigns buy our refrigerator or buy our car, you're going to save money over the long haul. We see a little bit of that, but, but not nearly as much as might be anticipated. Okay, one explanation is that rational consumers are already maximizing, and it's not mysterious that the Toyota Prius is very inexpensive to run, and some car cars aren't. So that that massive advertising campaign wouldn't be helpful to anyone. That's one account. Another account is that boundedly rational people don't care about advertisements of that sort, so the companies would just be wasting their money. And uh, the data that we have is not decisive in favor of the second account, but the data that we have is consistent with the second account. Now, if the second account is correct, that boundedly rational people don't care, Oren says, why not have a, a massive or at least significant public educational campaign akin to the public educational campaigns involving cigarette smoking, maybe, saying, consumers, you have a lot to gain. Do this. And it is the case that the stickers now in the United States, they don't just say the annual fuel cost, they say how much you're going to spend over five years compared to the average vehicle. So it doesn't quite give you a life of the vehicle total cost, but it goes in that direction. Now, maybe we'd think, and this is how I tend to think, that that's what you should do, and maybe do more, and that's all you should do. 
-hmm. that to have an aggressive regulatory uh, intervention on top of that is un undesirable. And that's, I think that is correct. That's generally what you should do. The puzzle is, if you run the cost-benefit analysis of the regulations, there are billions of dollars in euros in net benefits. And to ignore that would not uh, be helpful for people. Unless people have something in their utility functions that we're missing. And it's very hard to try to figure out what that would be, given that the refrigerators are just as good refrigerators. The only thing they do is cost more up front and much less over the life of the refrigerator. Now, I think one could say that people have a discount rate wh or which you shouldn't second guess. And, of course, there's heterogeneity with respect to the discount rates of rational people. Mm -hmm. But the median or average discount rate would have to be stunningly high mm -hmm. for these rules not to be justified. So stunningly high that they don't track the median or average behavior of rational human beings in other domains of their lives. People aren't taking out standardly, 25 loans with a 25% interest rate. And that's kind of what you're doing if you buy an energy inefficient mm -hmm. appliance. Mm -hmm. So my kind of presumption in favor of soft rather than hard approaches runs into a wall in the form of, uh, of a cost-benefit analysis which cuts hard in the other direction. Now, we can be skeptical about interpersonal comparisons of utility and probably in some context should be, but I wouldn't want to make that into a theology, our skepticism about interpersonal comparisons of utility, because if we turn into a th theology, then intrapersonal comparisons of utility are also very difficult to undertake, given that a person is a collection of selves over time, at least in one sense. And if on net, over the next five years, you're thousands of dollars in euros better off, you're probably better off. Mm. <laughs> Sabino Cassese. I'm, oh, sorry. <laughs> I have two, two comments and questions. The first one is for Mr. Alexander Winter, Winterstein. Uh, this is about um, uh, Microsoft and, nad and Google nudging. Now, Microsoft and Google were perfectly legitimized to nudge, provided they did not violate antitrust laws. At a certain point, you did come in and said, you violate antitrust laws. And this was a very interesting way to keep nudging under control, but this was a case of public regulation of private nudging. Now, I understand that we are more interested in the opposite side of the picture, which is public nudging, that is nudging by administrative agencies. And why do we ask this as a special problem? because there are some peculiarities, because we assume that uh, public administrative agencies, they use a certain degree of authority, or because they have more impact on freedom, or because they use uh, green holes or black holes, and they put together regulation and nudging, and the mixture of regulation and nudging may be more dangerous than uh, simple, honest regulation. My question is, would you be ready to review with the same criteria, nudging by administrative agencies, with the same criteria that you used by reviewing Microsoft and Google? And do you think that the Court of Justice would be ready to use the same criteria with the uh, with the nudging by the commission. 
the same criteria that were used by, by the European Court of Justice vis-a-vis -vis the Google and Microsoft. My second question is a more general question about this discussion, which is the dilemma between interference and not interference. Now, it seems to me that if you assume that if nudging does not interfere, does not need justification, and on the contrary, if does interfere with choice, is not nudging, the central point of our seminar disappears, evaporates, because we don't have to ask ourselves if we have to explore the legitimacy of nudging by public authorities. That is a, a difficult question. I will try to um, I will try my best to give an intelligent um, answer to this. Uh, it's true that, as I said at the very beginning, the Commission does two things. One is to initiate legislation on the basis of, of evidence, and it is there where behavioral economics plays uh, an increasing role in certain areas. And, the, and my colleague on the first panel, um, who is involved in this kind of uh, thinking, um, uh, spoke, about, spoke about that. What I, what I do is not, is not policy making. Uh, but is in enforcement of of the antitrust rules, and where behavioral economics come in sometimes, like in cases like uh, of Microsoft, is to first establish um, the antitrust nature of a problem. Now the problem here is that consumers um, got a default browser or a default uh, media player, and then they they stuck with it, and competitors couldn't come in. Um, that was the practice. Uh, and we use behavioral economics insights to uh, declare that practice a problem. Whereas in the United States, so Bork and Posner would say, this is not a problem. It's not an antitrust problem. The behavioral economics may say what they will say, but this is not an antitrust problem because our theory of the way people and consumers react says that a consumer will switch. And therefore, you just go to different, so you go to Bing or to any other Yahoo or any other search engine, and, and that's it. There is no problem. So that's the first step where behavioral economics uh, come in. Um, we see the nudge, we see the default rule, and we say that's the same thing as actually forcing uh, someone, forcing you to buy not only the printer but also the ink from me. So once we have a problem, the question is how do we solve it? And there is a, a type of remedy that we used in the past that didn't use behavioral in insights, which just says, okay, um, you just stop it. Stop bundling these two together. Offer a, uh, an operating system without the, um, without the media player. Let the consumer, if the consumer wants one, he can go and find one. That is the, the standard remedy. But it didn't work. And why did it not work? Because we did not actually overcome the, the, the default problem. We did not activate the consumer's uh, choice. Uh, which is why we tried to sort of nudge, not nudge, we, we, we didn't nudge, the, the decision didn't nudge, but it neutralized the nudge in a, in a way that uh, a choice was very clearly and very transparently given to the consumers. That he actively uh, de-clicks uh, the, um, or rather um, chooses the browser, the, browser, the browser that he wants to and that the initial default is declicked. So he gets a sort of a blank choice for the first time. But once he makes, it, makes his choice, then of course uh, he goes with it and then he can change, etc. Um, so I don't think we were actually uh, nudging ourselves. I think what we did was recognizing a monopolist's nudge as a problem and trying to neutralize it with a remedy. So not nudging ourselves. The, the court has looked at that, but of course, as I said, Microsoft has complained and said, what is this, this voodoo, uh, voodoo economics? Uh, and, uh, and the court looked at the facts and said, well, that, that's the way consumers behave. It is a fact that consumers, when they find a default browser, do not, are less likely to switch to another browser. And that is a competition problem. And that is, so that was, that was confirmed. Um, now, what would happen if the Commission 
or any other regulator did itself nudge? Well, I think the, the review by the court, when the European Court reviews what the Commission does, they check whether we stick uh, on uh, stick to the legal basis, which is which is ours. So, are we within the realm of competence that we have, or are we infringing other people's, especially member states uh, or the Council's uh, competence? And I think this, it would be the same standard of review, whether it is a nudge or an explicit um, uh, directive. Uh, within within the regulation, I think there's even pending legislation in Luxembourg about the tobacco directive, which does include um, a number of nudges or so packaging, etc. We still have to wait um, what happens what happens here. But I, I'd like to stress that the, in terms of enforcement, uh, it is not nudging; it is, I think, a neutralization or a taking into account of nudging that we observe. By the way, the United States authorities they don't look at this at all. They looked at at, at Google's practices and said, well, you know. You can switch, so it's not a problem. Posner, Bork, still very much alive. <laughs> to the DOJ. Okay. <laughs> okay, so it's, it's probably not the worst idea to say that any action by government has to be justified, uh, and uh, also to say that any action by government that intrudes on fundamental rights needs a particular justification. And if it's a choice-preserving intrusion, uh, maybe the justification needn't be as uh, overwhelming as if it's not choice preserving, but uh, had better be pretty good. So a nudge that interferes with uh, political rights, say, or uh, freedom of religion, uh, even if it's choice preserving, it probably needs a very powerful justification. Um, Mr. Almano's question uh, reminded me of an idea that I had while you held your statement, and it was um, <clears throat> the center, It was um, regarding the question whether um, we would apply the same standards to the public sector than we apply to Google, um, and that was your sentence. It was. It really matters where in the list you are. That's what you said, and I thought when you said that. On uh, on a uh, uh, case which uh, doesn't uh, relate to antitrust in a, in a smaller sense, but in a wider sense, namely in uh, elections, um, when it really matters where in the list you are, maybe it's constitutionally relevant that mm -hmm. that our election documents look like they look, and maybe the oligopolists who have to say how the how these documents are designed they set themselves and the first positions always so in germany at least it's the first the, the biggest parties are always in the first um, position so maybe in uh, terms of <coughs> uh, in terms of e equal chances for parties which is a requirement under the constitution maybe it's um, constitutionally uh, yeah, relevant to, to make, for example, a random order. Would you would you agree? Personally, that's first. I mean, I I think it's a very interesting question. I'm very happy to take it. I do also think it's not necessarily a question to me. Yeah, uh, <laughs> but of course, to to all these um, uh, much more qualified yes. constitutional yeah. and and other lawyers. <laughs> in the room. Um, a randomization, I, th would, I think, I find a very interesting idea. There is a lot of behavioral uh, uh, work going on uh, on, on ballot um, uh, sheets. Um, how to design them. I think there were experiments uh, in Latin America <coughs> where they tried to have mm -hmm. um, a picture, the, 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 the pictures, and when you, when you scroll on the machines, when you scroll uh, to the party that you want, you get all the pictures of the people, and then you can click on the pictures, and you can... So, I mean, you can be very uh, elaborate, um, so I think that would certainly um, uh, be a good idea. I'm just not sure whether people, when they vote, really are as influenced by the order of the parties as you all are when you look at the list of search results. Um, because mm -hmm. uh, whether you want it or not, you are going to look at the first, first and foremost, and then perhaps at the second, eventually on the third, but that's where you stop. Yeah. In most of, I mean, statistically speaking, uh, that's 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 where you stop. I'm, I'm not sure the same is true for no, voting. Uh, I think their preferences are are slightly more, um, uh, slightly Probably stronger. Probably you thought about it before. 
for you. Uh, that is it. that is at least the that's certainly what <laughs> the <laughs> rational choice uh, <laughs> yeah. uh, people would would say. But I would very much leave this question to those that are more uh, more intelligent than I am. We are already infringing upon the lunch break, but we're a little bit compensating for the two long coffee breaks. So I think we have one more question to to take. That is that right? There's still something I don't really understand about nudging, so that's the question <laughs> for... <laughs> Only oh. one thing. <laughs> okay, yeah, so right. given the question of energy efficiency, and we have cars which are exactly the same apart um, for the question of energy consumption. So all consumers will be financially better off, the environment will be better off if they buy the more energy uh, or the car which is consuming less energy. And still you say that normatively all the government should do is to nudge people into buying the better cars. They should not impose, if I understand you, stand you correctly, man mandatory rules concerning energy efficiency. So before I read, I think as many others, your proposal in a particular political context where maybe nudging is all we can achieve, where we can't achieve any mandatory rules on energy efficiency. But now you said that normatively you're still opposed to more hard um, instruments, and I just would like to know why. Yeah, okay, so I, I must not have been clear. So I, this is a, pu a puzzle. So I'll, I'll tell you my normative inclination, but what I really meant to identify is the puzzle. Mm -hmm. So uh, let, let's suppose that... Uh, we know for a fact that consumers are better off with a mandate. So on social welfare grounds, uh, consumers win, and there isn't any set of losers who lose anything significant. So on social welfare grounds, the mandate produces a significant improvement. We just know that. Since the master concept is welfare, bracketing the question whether there's any autonomy problem, and in these cases, it's not easy to identify an autonomy problem, then I'm for the mandate. And when I was in the government, you know, I had some role in the mandate, and I wasn't sad when the Obama administration issued the mandate because the cost-benefit analysis is so powerful. So social welfare is our master concept, bracketing the question whether there's some autonomy or democracy or dignity issue. And in, these in this case, by the way, there's complete transparency. And the democratic process was very enthusiastic about it. It's pretty much bipartisan. So it had a very strong democratic pedigree with full transparency and accountability. So th the reason for having a presumption for nudges over mandates when you don't have a standard market failure is welfareist or based on autonomy. And here the presumptions just overcome. Now, the reason there's a puzzle is that, as we've discussed, consumers should be making rational choices, and if they aren't, the preferred remedy is to inform them in a way that's salient. But if you have cost-benefit analysis that shows they're really better off, and the number of losers is small, and they're not losing much, then it seems like a pretty good policy. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> See you after lunch. Mm -hmm.